you again. Thank you for joining us this evening for our virtual artist talk. My name is Kendall Taylor. I'm part of the co-curation team for 965. Please take this time to mute your microphone and turn off your camera to reduce any distractions. We will have a few minutes to answer questions after each artist presents. And of course, if you have questions, we welcome them in the chat section. I would like to begin tonight's discussion with an acknowledgement of Black History Month and of the land we live and thrive on. We honor Black History Month with our collective dedication to equity, allyship, and the harnessing of a spirit that aims to disrupt, dis excuse me, disrupt oppressive systems that affect the Black community. Moving forward requires action. The following is an MSU Denver Office of Diversity and Inclusion land acknowledgement. We honor and acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne and Arapaho nations. This area was also the site of trade, hunting, gathering, and healing for many other Native nations. We recognize the Indigenous peoples as the original stewards of the land. Let us also acknowledge the painful history of genocide and the forced removal from this territory. We respect the many diverse indigenous peoples still connected to the land on which we gather. And thank you again for joining us this evening. Sherry, don't forget to unmute yourself. <laughs> is, it, is it a Teams meeting if someone doesn't forget to turn on their mic? Thank you, Kendall. Um, uh, we're so happy you're here with us tonight and we're grateful to the artists uh, attending for speaking about their work here. Before we turn it over to the artists, let me tell you a little about the 965 Project Gallery and our current exhibition. The 965 Project Gallery is a student-led space that provides professional development opportunities to MSU Denver students interested in the art industry. Located inside the CVA, the 965 Project Gallery is curated and managed by student employees who are mentored by gallery and museum professionals. We're able to create the entire show from planning to layout and installation to events like this one in which we're able to communicate our artists with the CVA community. For our exhibition, Deeper Than Skin, we sought to find Denver artists who were examining life experiences within the Black community. The culmination of local activism stemming from the summer 2020 and ongoing civil rights movements highlight the continuation of the social justice timeline. This exhibition promotes community perseverance and humanizing actions. This exhibition was co-curated by a team made up of current and recently graduated MSU Denver students, Sherry Myers, Kendall Taylor, Molly Quinn, and Sheila Mungai. Tonight, we'll be hearing from three of the artists with work in the exhibition, Tyree Jones, Evans Alex Centiel, and Jasmine Winter. Kendall will lead the Q&A for each of the artists presenting tonight. Thank you, Sherry. Now for the super fun part. So again, just a quick reminder, just to make sure that our microphones are muted and cameras are off. We will be taking those questions in the chat. In the kick off the discussion, we'll be hearing from Jasmine Winter, then from Alex Even Centel, Centel, excuse me, and then we'll be hearing from Tyree Jones. So to start us off, Jasmine is a recent MSU Denver graduate. Her graceful use of soft pastel enhanced her ability to discuss issues the Black community faces. Jasmine, thank you so much for being here tonight. Hi, thanks, Kendall, for that great introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Should I turn on my camera? I don't think it matters. Does it matter if my camera's on or not? We would love to see your face, but it's also whatever works best for your connection and your comfort. Okay, so I will turn on my camera. Fun note, this little thingy right here, my glasses just broke at the start of this. So that's what that is. is. <laughs> <laughs> just a little note. There's not like a white blob thing on my face. I just, my glasses just broke right before I had to present. All right. Um, so uh, Shades of Black is an extension. It started off as um, 
two pieces called Black and Blue that really focused on adolescence. And then I was reached out from Molly to say, be a part of the um, Deeper Than Skin exhibition. And I planned on extending it further. So now it's called Shades of Black. And yeah, so let's get to the, go to the next slide. Awesome, thank you. So um, I'm going to be reading everything on the screen just for the purposes of that's, I know some people communicate differently. Um, some It's easier for some people to hear things and some people to see things. So I'll read off the screen and then add additional notes. Um, but Shades of Black is a cultural lens into the perspective of Black childhood and its many shades. The series presents hyperbolic depiction of a select few experiences that have infiltrated Black adolescents' lives and manifested violent, vicious effects in the years that are meant for innocence, ignorance, and carefree behavior. So something, just to make a point is, although each of these pieces that I've presented here today to you all um, and created have very specific gendered placements, everything that I am going to kind of break down and digest is something all Black people in the community, regardless of their gender, right, regardless of where they're from, whether it's African diaspora or born and birthed in America, um, they all can experience these types of shades and modes of difficulty that Black adolescents experience. And um, for each piece, I'm just going to kind of dissect which section of Black adolescence that I really wanted to focus on and why I chose the imagery that I did and the colors that I did. So, yeah. Go to the next slide. Thank you. All right, so the first one is called Bang. All of these are made out of soft pastel. This was a part of my first series, Black and Blue, um, when I made it in 2018. And this is probably the most relevant one that we're all aware of in our society today in terms of just murder in term, um, when it comes to Black individuals. And while we're really, really aware of it in terms of teenagers or adults, it also happens to children. They meet massive brutality and death um, in the community. And oftentimes it is seen within police brutality. And that's such a big conversation now, and it's always been a big conversation um, since the civil rights movement, since 1955 with the whole, you know, wasn't necessarily police brutality, but with Emma Tilde and being violated by um, kind of, you know, white, white supremacy and dying at the hands of that. So it ranges in a lot of different effects, but the, the, the lens we've seen currently is police brutality. But I wanted to focus with the blueness of the skin and the bullet hole in the head, I wanted to focus on um, just the ways in which it's still prevalent. So the boys looking at you clearly not alive, but still very much so alive, right? Looking directly at you, confronting you. Um, and the bullet hole signifies that kind of, the way it's penetrated the community historically, but also how present it is within the community that children have to leave behind their innocence and carefreeness of just play in order to keep their lives because too many times they've been subjected to dying just because they do everything that normal kids do. Kids aren't supposed to know how to do things. Kids are supposed to mess up and make mistakes and do really reckless things. And black individuals, black children are not allowed that space to do that because of the ways historically um, this land has deemed them as dangerous and animalistic. So that is my first piece. Thank you. Um, the second piece, Too Grown, is directed towards sexual assault and the cultural space of sexual assault. Unfortunately, it does have a culture um, and it has a very prominent place in our everyday world and anyone can experience it and anyone can be in the dynamic of being an abuser. But for this particular piece, I'm focusing on sexual violence when it comes to adolescence. Once again, that innocence, that ignorance of not understanding their bodies and understanding the dynamics of 
sex and power and what that looks like and when that's supposed to look like something um, is they take, they get into really, really awful, traumatic, harmful situations. And um, we also see that while Black boys are celebrated for having sexual experiences at the youngest age of even nine, um, Black girls also experience inappropriate and violent sexual behavior. And they, they're then kind of blamed for it, right? So Black boys are celebrated and while Black girls could have been prevented, right? Not dressing in revealing clothing, all that stuff. But make, make no you know, mistake, even though Black boys are celebrated for that, it's still violent. They just don't understand that being in sexual spaces at 9, 10, and 11 with people who are much older than you or have different power dynamics is still violence and abuse. And that kind of goes into the culture of it. Um, so once again, they're forced into these modes of adulthood and being aware of things that they shouldn't have to be aware of yet in order to keep themselves safe. Um, and so I use the red lipstick to kind of um, talk about that prominent sexual, you know, the sexy red lip and, you know, chunky gold earrings to kind of put things on the figure to make the figure look grown with the eyelashes and the lipstick and the earring, but also this very saturated, sad, uncomfortable face in order to propose that while they are put in these spaces, they're not aware of what's going on or why it's going on, and it shouldn't be. Um, and this figure is not confronting the viewer because they're, it's kind of this dynamic of them looking at someone else in the room and to say the whoever is in the room dominating the situation, right? As uncomfortable as that is to say, that often happens, right? This whole um, instance is very uncomfortable. So really pushing that uncomfortableness of the figure looking up and having this face of someone else is there dominating the situation is really what I was trying to do to um, push that dynamic of sexual violence. And that's, that's it for that piece. Um, dime bag. So if, if we don't know what dime bag is, dime bag is just a slang term for um, a certain amount of weed that you would put in a little baggie. Um, it's usually terms for people who sell substances, so drug dealers and stuff like that. Um, and this one is really focusing on um, financial stability is a massive concern for everyone, right? Everyone needs to be able to support themselves. But as we have seen in terms of reparations and just gener um, generationally with poverty and things like that, um, Black communities have suffered the hand of that, as well as Indigenous, as well as Latinx. But they are also a part of that dynamic of generational poverty just as much as generational wealth is a thing. And so oftentimes we'll see Black youth setting aside their futures, setting aside their mental, emotional, physical stability, right, and health to help their parents, help their families survive and be able to eat and have ends meet. And sometimes it is legal spaces, but um, it's very strenuous and stops them from doing the things that a kid should be able to do, which is go have education, have a life, be with their friends. Um, but sometimes it is illegal. And this also, once again, kind of puts them in danger of losing that future of their life, right? Whether it be incarceration, which is a whole other thing on its own, or death. So these types of strenuous financial um, chains that wrap around Black youth, they have to give up a lot that they shouldn't have to being so young, right? Um, and not any fault of their own with their parents or their upbringing, but they, they are pressured to have an obligation to help just keeping them and their family alive and surviving, right? So having the dime bag kind of stapled into the figure's head with the blood, the blood signifies the detriment of constantly reaching this goal of financial stability because eventually it's going to cause ramifications beyond 
anything that they could really consider or understand at that moment, at that point in time, trying to, you know, gain whatever money they can so that they can eat the next week. So that's really what that one was focused on. Um, and Hush, um, last one is really about the common experience that I've had that any, really any person of color had, but especially black individuals, especially, especially black women, um, black women who identify um, this, lack of being able to hold emotion and rage within you, these natural human emotions that everyone has to experience and live through in their life, the lack of being able to really express those and put those out in the world um, is how this is kind of, I'm half exemplifying this. this. You're denied your emotions and you have to kind of let them fester and kind of push them down because you don't want to be seen as hostile or dangerous and those situations can escalate into you losing your life, right? You being violently brutalized as we've seen once again within police brutality, but even just in communities and in your home and things like that, even in schools, like you can be really emotionally and sometimes physically brutalized for speaking out about something that makes you angry and that enrages you, something that should, you know, everyone should have access to, you no longer have access to in order to keep your life. So um, by evoking the red, that's that rage that building up, that really that rage that gets saturated throughout your entire body. And then this kind of painful attachment of zippers on the figure's lips to evoke, there's no, there's no way to really express it, right? It's there, but it's painful to keep going back and forth with the experience of letting out your rage, but then being silenced, right? Um, and a lot of that lack of validation causes, once again, mental, emotional, physical detriment to a youth's body and experience and the way that they grow up. And that torment and trauma is going to affect them long beyond their years of being young, right? So that's really, once again, em emphasizing that specific section of blackness and shades of blackness that exist and, you know, really, really just grind down the bare essentials of black youth to nothingness. So that that's that one. Um, so overall, when it comes to my work, regardless of if I'm talking about race or just language, gender, whatever it may be, is getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. Um, I am a person who is very comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that's the thing that I try to do when I'm reaching my viewer. Um, in this specific piece, I'm using really, really hyper symbolic um, imagery to saturate the viewer in what it feels like to be in that space. Because there are going to be people who view my work that do not know what it's like to be a black individual. And then therefore, doesn't know what it's like to have those emotions, right? Have certain things stripped away from you. And so by using that really, really saturated, uncomfortable, harsh imagery, I am creating a space for the viewer to feel what's actually happening within those experiences, but then also give honesty to what those things feel like. Again, because those feelings um, are very, very, Almost, they're indescribable. And so the closest that I've gotten to actually being able to depict that is through these really harsh visuals and colors that I've um, chosen for this work. And ultimately I want people to face it head on and not shy away, not pretend, not kind of, you know, desaturate it to make it more comfortable or easier to digest and swallow, but really taking all of it in for what it is because without really experiencing or even realizing what the whole totality of something exists and how it exists, we can never assess it properly and then eradicate it, which is ultimately um, something that I'm passionate about, eradicating these spaces um, and creating new ones that oppose the ways in which they've dictated people's lives. So that's that's the, the whole of my work and 
you know, why I do it and, and you know, how I want people to view it and, and interact with it. Beautiful. Thank you so very much, Jasmine. Yeah. That was wonderful. We do have a question. Okay. Wonderful. Um, Tyree asks, why do you choose the different colors for the skin tone in each piece? And you know what, Amy's question kind of builds on that as well. I'm just going to throw that out to you as well. I think it'll be a similar answer potentially. Did you choose to work in pastels, which has a softness to contrast with the harsh and uncomfortable imagery or are pastels, excuse me, your usual, usual medium for most of your work? So that there is kind of a combination to that. For sure. Um, so Tyree, the reason I choose I chose different colors, um, it's a it's a play on using colors to evoke a certain emotion, but then also playing on that dynamic of oh a black and white type of world that we live in. So I use colors in the black and white to really really evoke um, the saturation of that symbol and how it affects the figure, um, as well as that this idea of like, oh, well, it's just black and white when really it's not, it's a lot of gray area when it comes to these situations. And then when it comes to the blues and the reds that I use, that was really to saturate um, the emotion in those specific images. And so I wanna just play with that back and forth with the grays and the saturation of color, but then some of them being overly saturated with color. So just like a play of emotion, but then also kind of a, a topic of, how do we actually tackle these things if we only see them as this or that, if that makes sense? Um, and Amy, that's a great observation. Um, no, <laughs> that's a great observation though that I've never thought of with the softness of pastel with like the harshness of these topics. It's just, soft pastel is just something, a medium that I can, I can really push beyond anything that I thought I could push it to. And it just creates a, a depth and a richness to my work that I found other mediums haven't been able to um, provide me. So that's really the biggest reason I, I do most of my works in soft pastels ever since I discovered it. But that's a great observation for the comparing, comparing contrast of harshness of subject matter to the softness of a material. That's wonderful. Thank you so very much for your time, Jasmine. That was very insightful. Um, it really brings just new depth to your pieces. And thank you to Tyree and Amy for your questions. Next, we will hear from Evans Alex Centiel. He is a Denver-based interdisciplinary artist and current MSU Denver student. His photography focuses on motion, time, and the human experience. Alex, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Even? Hey. hey. <laughs> thank you for the invite. And also thank you for um, the staff at uh, Mapping Swap Gallery for putting together the show. It's an amazing show. Um, where do we start? Uh, next, next slide, please. So, um, so for the show, I, I decided to go with uh, May 30th. May 30th was... Um, the, let me see, the third day of the protest um, um, in 2020 here in Denver. Um, I decided May, May 30th because it was the day I feel like was more impactful to me um, because uh, as you will see in the photographs that come, um, a, lot ha a lot of action happened that day as far as like um, of, um, the, the police and the protesters and how, the, the, and how that interaction went. And, and the way I perceived it was going to happen, it was going to go down, but it, it, it did not go down that way. Um, also, um, um, May 30th almost didn't happen. Oh, the documentary protest almost did not happen because um, at the time, I had just finished a previous documentary on um, Michael Hancock. I don't think everyone is familiar, but he was an Uber driver back in 2018. Um, he was driving a, a guy at 2 in the morning, a guy attacked him, and he was a Michael Hancock was a concealed weapons carry permit holder, and he protected himself against the guy. And then different police um, did not believe his story, so they put together a story. But in the meantime, they kept him in jail for 15 months while they put together the story. And ultimately, May, May 10th of the following year, um, he was found not guilty. So I documented his family the, the entire time he was in jail, fighting fighting this charge. Um, but anyway, so, so almost didn't happen. 
Um, May 30th, um, in my opinion, a lot of questions need to be answered. Um, um, I'm, I saw a lot of people get hurt that day that shouldn't have, that shouldn't have not gotten hurt by police. Um, just pretty much just the, the posture the police had that day was just like, like it, didn't make, it didn't make any sense to me. Um, so I had to document it. Um, and my, interpret my interpretation of that day, um, it, it was a tough day emotionally for me because I could because I had to, uh, because I had so many emotions running through me. You know, it was like at one point I wanted to document the protest, and at one point I was angry, at one point I was sad. Um, there was just so much going on. Um, um, also, uh, the police interpretation and tenor that day. That's the question that I I hope um, uh, when people. Um, do see these photos? They ask themselves as well as as the as the local police. Like, you know, what were you guys doing? What what what, what, what were you guys doing? Because it's the property, because no property was being damaged. As you see in the photos, people were just out there protesting. You know, kind of like showing the force. You know, showing that they were angry and were not police police accountability, or whatever. Um, and the last bullet is police accountability. I mean, we we need some police accountability. Um, it's been so long and in years and there's still a lot of people whose families are still waiting for questions to be answered. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, okay, so so the first, I won't be talking about all the photos because it's, it's like 19 slides, um, but um, some of the photos speak for themselves. Um, for instance, this first photo, um, um, so some some of the little things that that uh, you have to pay attention to, like you know, it's, what it says, if you're not outraged, uh, you're not paying attention. You know, um, I try to, I try to like most, uh, I try to kind of like find the little details in the images or or in the scene, and as well as uh, uh, try to look at it from a different perspective, not from perspective as uh, from someone outside looking in, but from, from someone inside, you, you know, kind of like looking inside, if that makes sense to everyone. Um, also, uh, that first image, oh, I'm sorry, let me go back. So all these images were were made on one intersection. So right in front of the Denver Capitol building, in the corner of Colfax and I think it's Broadway? No, Lincoln, I'm sorry, Lincoln. Uh, so um, next slide, please. Okay, so so this these two images, the image to the my left, I guess your left too. Um, that image reminded me so much of uh, some of the um, old um, old um, protest images from like um, from from the Vietnam era. Or just, uh, just, it just it, it kind of like illustrates just like what was happening that day. You know, this gentleman in front of me, um, I remember him, there's, um, there's another image of him in there somewhere. Uh, he was just standing there, you know, and, and you, you notice the other guys just kind of standing there, he just, he just had his hand up. And he, he, and the, all people who were doing it were just standing there with their hands up. And it, and it was part of my mind why they were being tear gas, why they were being um, pepper sprayed, and why they were being shot with rubber bullets. Like I myself, at, at I, a few times, well, I had, they were uh, targeting me, and I clearly had two cameras in my hand running around, like well, I'm just trying to take photos. Um, but but that line itself, where the, where the guy is standing, that was pretty much the the, the what's the looking for the line between the protesters and the police. Um, also, if you look to the right image, um, there's a it, there's a police uh, armored vehicle, and it doesn't make any sense to me to have an armored vehicle for protesters. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so so some of these images, like first is the image on the left, was was uh, if you compare it to if you compare it to the image to the right, right where that gentleman is in the middle of the, of the smoke, um, that young woman is to the left of that guy. Um, and that was just the line. People were just sitting in at the line, and the police was kind of like just pushing him back. Um, I'm just staying there. Uh, next slide, please. More. You, you can continue to um, slide through him, please.
Uh, you can pause right here real quick. Um, I just want to say something about the image to the right. The image to the right is um, um, the, the, the guy that's running, uh, he was one of the people uh, who was, so, so pretty much uh, the protesters got smart, you know, and they decided, they, just, they, they uh, realized that when the police would shoot tear gas at them, it would come to like those canisters and they would have um, um, construction cones and they'll and it would never, whenever one of those canisters land near someone or the group, they'll run out and put uh, uh, a traffic cone over the canister. So that way, so that way, the um, the tear gas or whatever does not, you know, just hurt people. And and as soon as he ran out there, and they they saw him, the police saw him, the police saw him, should should uh, tear gas at him. And uh, I just had to capture it. I mean, I just just capturing him, kind of like. Yeah. Next, next slide, please. So, hold on, what's that? So if if you notice um image to the left, there um uh, you can see the 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 forefront of the image uh, on front left, you see um uh, one of the one of those canisters exploding and and then you see, you see a person kinda of like jumping on the ground. Um but you can see the, the canister exploding to the left and then everyone kinda of like reacted. Um all right, next slide please. I think that's it, right? Um, so the la the bottom left image was it pretty much gives you uh, uh, a view of what was happening that day. Again, um, there it was there was no um, I didn't notice any violence on that day as far as the protesters on the protesters side. Uh, again, I was pretty much I, I felt more afraid of being. Of, of, of being heard by the police that day and some, some actual protesters themselves. Um, um, and I have a, a history of being in um, places where, where it's pretty dangerous. Um, and, and that day, it, wasn't, um, it, was, it was similar, but, it, but again, it wasn't like I was, fight, I, I, um, I was fighting enemies. It was, I would say pretty much they just make sense of what was happening. Um, yeah, I, I so pretty so to, to end this, I, I I really wanted to to document what was happening, and so for the so for a future generation to have a documentation of of of, of documentation of what happened at those those days from someone who's experiencing what, what's happening. Um, so like pretty, pretty much, I've been a victim of of, of uh, police with um misconduct, so not from someone who has it been as, as an experience before. Um, so this is a sort of a, so I could totally relate to it, and I hope that people could see things through my lens and not through the lens of someone who's sitting at home and in, in, in another state or another county, or whatever, and then you see what they're being, what what news people, what news media is being given to them. Um, and I hope, I hope these images um, um, spark those questions that we should be asking our, our politicians and. Elected officials. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alex. Beautiful, beautiful right. photography. And to be on the ground like that is so much emotion in front of and behind the camera. Um, and it's almost too much to capture, but you've been able to. Uh, we do have a few questions. Hannah has asked. <clears throat> Can you please share why you chose to present black and white images rather than color images? All right, good, great question. Um, so or, originally, I was documenting the protests in, in color images because, because I wanted to obviously um, I wanted to document the current times uh, in color. However, um, as as the protests um, as one protest passes after another, 
Um, and and I started seeing the little action that was being taken by 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 people who you know who's elected to, to, to make um, policy changes for us. Like for instance, um, uh, Mayor Hancock. Um, man, Hancock, the first couple of days, or maybe a week or so, he didn't come out. You know, it was like, you know, this is your city, man. Like, you can come out and say something. Only one politician, which was Leslie um, Harrod, I believe her name, she was the only person that came out. So as so as um, the days passed and I started going through the more protests, I realized, you know, nothing much, nothing has really changed from the from 1965 and 1966 to the rights movement. So, so, so pretty much... Um, until something changes, then we'll we'll, we'll, we'll kind of we'll, um, we'll have some stuff in color. Um, so reason why I went, I decided black or white because I wanted to kind of like keep it keep it the same as uh, their first civil rights movement in the sixties. Wonderful. Oh, Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, about the continuation of the time the timeline. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, we have a couple more questions for you. Um, Lizeth has asked, um, as far as your process of getting these particular photos, um, are you just kind of following your heart and taking the pictures of people? Do you have a conversation? Uh, do you tell them you're an artist? Do you take the picture and leave? Um, she just wants a little bit more insight um, into this type of uh, photojournalism in a way. Yeah. <laughs> So I had a photography professor at Metro, um, Jay, um, a few years ago. And Jay, something I remember from Jay, he, 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 he's retired now, but Jay was like, he told me, um, if it's a public place, you can do whatever you want. You know, like, like so, so so I took those words uh, and I ran with them. And also, there was just so much going on, people didn't care. And I, and to be honest, I didn't care. Um, if uh, I don't remember... Well, there are a few people, not this protest, but a few after people would say, don't take, don't take my photo, and I'll just take the photo anyway. But, but sometimes when I'm actually in the moment, um, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say fine, and I won't snap your photograph. But um, did I answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> I do believe you touched on the, um, the confidence and yeah. in, in what was, yes, yes, lovely. Wonderful. Thank you, Lizeth, for answering that. Um, we have a couple of more questions for you. Um, Sheila has asked, how do you further the narrative um, inequality, equality at this point, um, as far as she's noticing the, um, she can't help but notice the stark differences between these images and let's say January 6th with the insurrection. Um, so again, it kind of speaks to your answer before, but we'd love to hear more about that. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question one more time? Yeah, no problem. Sheila has asked, how do you further the narrative of inequality from this point? Um, can't help but notice the stark differences in the images from uh, these to, let's say, January 6th insurrection. Um, it's a really tough question. Um, the January 6th insurrection, um, it, I, I feel like there's, there's, there's not much of a, a comparison between them two, um, only because um, um, I mean, I mean, people people were were protesting some different things, you know. Uh, we've got one people, one one group of people protesting of uh, of uh, 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 an election or whatever. Then you have you have you have um, these groups of people who are protesting something that's, ha that's just happening in, um, in, in Denver, but like, you know, all over the, all over the, um, the United States and even uh, a part of the world, you know. Um, but to continue this, um, this talk, to continue, um, it, it's, I mean, I, I feel like what, I, what I've documented is, is very little compared to, um, um, very little of what we need to do. Uh, besides just put, pushing it out there, you know, we have to talk, we have to pretty much switch up the entire education system. Uh, you know, we've got to, we've got to like, we've got, we've got to look back and, 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 and really address our privileges, right? And that's, um, it's, 
Yeah, it's a really tough question to answer, but um, it, this is just one one small part. Um, I hope I was able to answer just a little tad bit of it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Evans. We have one more question to close out before finishing off our panel with the lovely Tyree Jones. Uh, but Alex, we were wondering as far as understanding the uh, prolific nature to your photography. Uh, we'd love maybe an, a website to be plugged into the chat. But from this particular day, how many works and how many pieces were you able to capture? Wow. Uh, um, this day, I believe it was about 2,200 images that I captured. Um, and I, oh, I didn't say this earlier, but, uh, but, but um, I, wanted, I wanted to say this. I wanted to say that um, black community photos, these protests have been uh, sort of like a, a performance art piece for me. You know, like I said, um, uh, just being in the space it, itself, um, running around, you know, trying to capture as much as I can. Um, and, and then, and then that's one, one performance, right? And then when I get home and I have to like look through the 2,000 images that I've taken, you know, and, and just being there by myself, just being in that moment itself, you know, it's, it's, uh, um, it's very emotional at times. And even to, even to, even today, you know, almost a year, a year later, I'm still, I still get emotional looking at some of these images. And, and this is just from one day. And um, um, as far as a, um, a, a website, I, I have some images on the website. I'll, I'll plug it into uh, the chat. Um, but yeah, this, there's, did I answer your question? You very much did, yes. Uh, you do have Yay. a wonderful extensive collection and um, and thank you for, for documenting all of that. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Lovely, lovely, lovely. thank you. Wonderful. And so, yes, to close out this lovely panel this evening, we will be hearing from Tyree Jones. Tyree is a Colorado native, a pen artist turned painter, who documents the Black experience with a vivid use of color and dedication to details. Tyree, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Hi, thank you. I'm really excited. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about my pro my project, We the Protest. Um, next slide. So I'm just gonna be talking about the project summary a bit. Sure, you can just um, pretty much show all of the points that I have on here. Um, so it's We the Protest is a group of four portraits depicting protesters that attended the Denver Black Lives Matter protests in 2020. Um, I have the project broken up into two different processes, which is the documenting process and the painting process. And um, the paintings serve to eradicate stigmas that are perpetuated against Black people and the Black Lives Matter group. Um, some of those stigmas being that um, we're violent or that it was a mob mentality um, or that the protests were unwarranted. Um, in my opinion, a lot of the protesters were afraid but they were passionate and standing in solidarity. And I thought that that was something that was to be admired. Next slide. Um, so I'm gonna start talking about the documenting process. And day one um, was really spent digesting the atmosphere of the protest. Um, it was actually on the same day that Evans was talking about, which is really crazy. <laughs> um, if you can show the pictures. So I just have some pictures from the day of the protest. Um, and it was a lot different than um, the days following um, because it was very hostile. The environment um, was crazy chaotic. There was a lot of violence and you know that was shown on the police side, obviously. Uh, when I first started the project, I intended on painting scenes from the protest instead of actually painting portraits. Um, but I felt, especially after the first day, that the scenes didn't accurately capture why people were there. Um, and I wanted to get more in depth with the people and make the project about the people after this day. Um, and yeah, on this day we were tear gassed, there were flash bombs, people were getting injured. Um, it was, a nightmare actually and I was very scared to even go in the first place and this day kind of exacerbated those fears 
and it made me not want to go back at all. But I knew that, you know, I had to in order to kind of show the reason why people are really here. Um, next slide. So days two through four, these are the days that um, were a little more peaceful. Um, they were spent actively protesting. These are the days that I recorded interviews with the protesters and I took some photographs of protesters. Um, there are some photographs of them. Um, sorry. So the interviews were more of conversations, I would say, than interviews. I started each one of them with just asking them why they attended the protest that day. And everyone was very open and candid with me. Um, and some were there because they felt that they needed to speak on, on, their, on others' behalf. Some were there because they felt that it was important to show their face despite the fear that they have. Um, and, you know, all the conversations that I had with everyone were very powerful. Um, for each portrait that I took, I asked the protesters to pose in whichever way that they felt best suited them. And, um, you know, some wanted to take on, um, not to use the word dramatic, but more dramatic poses than others. And some just wanted to be, you know, calm and shown as the way that I presented, like that I walked up to them. Um, and yeah, next slide. So now I'm gonna be talking about the painting process. First part is prepping and drafting. Um, I started every piece by listening to all the interviews because I had them recorded and then I would type out the entire transcript of them. This helped me get back into that place of being with them, connecting with them, talking with them. Um, and that's how I decided the background color because the background colors were very important to me in these pieces. Um, I felt that they represented the energy and the personalities that all of the people had given to me when I approached them. Um, for example, the one that's shown, he was very calm. I actually didn't speak to him. He was getting pictures taken by everyone. He just had his sign and everyone was going to him and taking a bunch of pictures. I just asked him, do you mind if I get a photo of you? He turned, took the picture and he just calmly walked away. And I thought that that was so powerful, especially in such a chaotic environment for someone to be so calm. And I really wanted to reflect that in the background. Um, and then of course, for the other paintings, um, a lot of the background colors were chosen based off of the conversations I had with them. So yeah, next slide. This is the actual painting process. Um, it took anywhere from five days to two weeks, kind of depended on how much I connected to each piece. Um, just go ahead and, yeah. And all, they're all painted on birch wood panels with oil paint. Um, I'm a very methodical painter, so everything was planned out from, you know, who I was going to paint on which day, where to start. Um, and yeah. And so an example for um, how, oh, I'm sorry, can you go back, Sherry, I'm sorry. An example for um, kind of how the length depended on how much I connected with each piece or with each person. Um, the empath painting took a little bit longer because we had a lot of the same feelings about the protests, kind of the anxieties that came with the protests and just kind of being worried for everyone there. And I really wanted to take my time with that piece. Um, so yeah, the, there was no, you know, everything's done after a certain couple of days, but it was really all about emotion and feeling with each piece. Okay. Now I'm gonna talk about each piece. So this is We Matter. I talked about this briefly, um, but this was the guy who was getting photographed. Um, and I wanted the leaves to kind of represent that um, constant, um, but slow change, um, very calm change, kind of like we see with the leaves changing. Um, the blue obviously is symbolic of his calm demeanor and um, his determined facial expression that he was giving me. He didn't have to say anything, but he said so much more, you know, than he could have. Um, 
So yeah, next slide. This is the empaths. This was a couple that I met. They were very kind and they talked about how afraid they were, which really resonated with me because I felt the same exact way being there, but I just wanted to do a project. I wanted to talk about it. And that's the same exact reason that they were there. And I felt a lot of connection to these two individuals. There was a lot of empathy. There was a lot of unity. Um, there was love in our conversation. And I felt like that was really represented um, by the colors um, that connect them in this piece. Next slide. This is the speaker. So he had spoken this day to a very large group of people, which I thought was very brave. I couldn't do it. I'm nervous just even speaking right now. <laughs> and um, he really felt that it was his civic responsibility to be there for all of these Black people and to speak on behalf of us. And he wanted the change to come from ourselves first in order to inflict change on others. And I thought that that was a very powerful statement and I think that he really represented that in his pose. Um, he was very thoughtful, and I really enjoyed that about him. Next slide. And this is today, tomorrow, and forever. Um, their interview had a lot to do with family history, especially on his side. Um, his family spent a lot of time protesting, and his brothers, he talked about, how it's impacted him growing up. And his interview was very prolific in that way is he felt that he was doing it for generations to come and it was not about himself at all. They were there for others more than they were there for themselves. And I think that the messages that all of these people sent really showed all of the different reasons why people were protesting and it that it wasn't just something that was violent and that there isn't this mob mentality, but there are all these beautiful different reasons that people are coming together in order to fight for something. You know, there's all these different stories and everybody just wants the same thing, which is to be treated fairly and equality for their loved ones and safety for themselves. Next slide. Next slide, Sherry. Next slide, is it working? Um, yeah, I'm on the next slide. I just, uh, do you want me to go ahead and play or do you want to set it up? The... Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see it, my bad. It, it, um, it the images are, are the, the same on both sides. So the screen cap and that one. So easy to, easy to think they're the same. Got it, my apologies. Okay, well, next I'm gonna be showing a video. The video is just comprised of raw footage from the protests, um, some paintings, some photographs, and um, some words from some of the protesters that I got when I interviewed them. So, take it away. Every time I see some of these people murdered, I see myself, I see my brothers, I see my dad, my cousins, I see my family, I see my friends. I'm trying to do everything in my power to make sure this doesn't happen to the people that I love. I got two sons! Their lives matter! Their lives matter! I got two little boys that I want to live! Um, so my name's Tyree. I'll introduce myself as well. Um, I just really wanted to know, you know, besides the obvious, what is the purpose that brings you guys out here today? I thought that I wanted to spread a lot of positivity and love and light in the world. I just feel like with all the injustices going on and all the people out here protesting, like we've been in the house for a long time. So there's already a lot of built up energy just from like Corona and then like all the injustices going on. So there are a lot of people who are coming to these protests just really angry and full of hate. And even if you're not angry and full of hate, it's easy to pick up on their energy when you're out here. Right. So we decided to come out here and spread good vibes because it's so easy easy to get caught up in the negativity of the crowd. Well, I'm an educator. Um, I teach middle school and I'm a behavior therapist for every kid up until 18. So for me, it's making sure that I am here just as a present so that, let me take this off, so that people can um, know that I'm here and that, you know, I'm that type of teacher and 
I can't protest in March, but I can pass out water. For the past, since since the protest started, we've had to hear helicopters for yes. the majority of our evenings. Even the other night, there was one at like 2 a.m. that woke me up out of my sleep. You hear the sirens, you hear the flash right. bombs. You, you can hear tell the when the helicopters are even closer because you can hear, like like she said, I've, yes. I've been getting anxiety from some of this, to be honest. It me is. Too. It's me a too. lot of, and I think it's the collective energy in the air. And there was already that grief in the air from COVID. Mm -hmm. And I think this just like lit a match just get tired because they they don't want to hear it that's exactly what i go through on a daily basis because people still are just hearing and not listening as i say racism still exists that our black people are being murdered that we don't feel as we, we matter i did this as a 16 year old little girl and here i am 46 doing it again with my children now and i just pray that this generation can help make a difference, but I'm gonna stand with them until the difference is made. That this whole movement is about really trying to open people's eyes and to push them to use their voice. Everybody likes the fact that they're a part of history and a part of fighting for this change, but to me it goes a little deeper than that. It's not so much the fact that I'm fighting for what the future holds, it's I'm creating the future. Yeah. I'm either out here doing everything in my power to make sure that my kids and grandkids are going to be taken care of and they won't have to worry about the same things that I'm worried about, right. or I'm going to sit my ass down, wait for someone else to make this their problem, and wait generations and generations and let's let this pile up some more history is going to uh, the future is going to come regardless you can either impact it or just let it pass you by yeah well thank you guys so much of course. that was so powerful <laughs>
I do have one last question for you, Tyree, before we wrap up this lovely panel. Thank you so much for your time. Okay. So with your current work, uh, with this particular exhibit, there is this element of recording. Um, is this a process that you will be reproducing for future collections, or do you think that it was just to resonate with this particular collection? Um, it's definitely something that I enjoy. I think it depends on the collection that I'm doing. Um, for my paintings, I'll definitely always be photographing something before I paint it. That just resonates with me, and that's something that I want in my work. Um, as far as interviewing and having conversations, I think that just depends on the project. But as far as taking photographs and um, emulating that in painting, that's something that I, I'm going to definitely keep doing. Beautiful. Thank you so very much, Tyree. Your work you. is wonderful. We appreciate you having um, been a part of 965. Thank you again to Evans and Jasmine. We appreciate your time as well. Sherry, I'll let you go ahead and take over at the ending of this lovely panel. All right. So thank you all so much once more for joining us. Um, thank you for taking time out of your evening. Um, uh, for any of you who are still students, uh, thanks for giving us some of your homework time. Uh, come by the CVA, please. If you have not seen uh, Deeper Than Skin yet, if you haven't uh, seen the exhibition in the main gallery, it is also uh, exquisite and powerful. Um, and that one is uh, Zanelli Mahali's Samyama Ninyama, uh, Hail the Dark Lioness. I apologize for any, uh, any mispronunciation of that. Um, but what I wanted to say is I'm so grateful to be surrounded by all of these powerful works um, every, every time I go into work. Um, I also want to thank our artists, uh, Jasmine, Evans, and Tyree, for participating in this event and for allowing us to present their work in the 965 Project Gallery. I would also like to thank my fellow curators, uh, Yay Team, Kendall, Sheila, and Molly. Thank you so much for your work and putting this exhibition together. And lastly, I would really like to thank the on behalf of the curation team, thank the CDA team, Cecily Cullen, Jenna Miles, Katie Taft, and Kristen Smith for the opportunity for us to be able to put this together and the support and guidance that they provided during the process. Uh, we've kept you five minutes longer than planned, so um, thank you. We love you. Go enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>